you're starting to see a shift in tone about the housing market because people aren't talking about the housing market boom as much as before and instead they're talking about a potential housing market bubble. Check it out. USA Today says, is a housing market crash on the horizon? And they have eight experts weigh in on the possibility of a housing market crash. CNN says, no one seems worried about a housing market bubble, just like last time the bubble burst. Bloomberg says the housing bubble risks are accelerating across Europe and Hong Kong. And MarketWatch says that more sellers are cutting their list prices for homes. So if you wanna know exactly what's going on in the housing market, make sure you watch this video till the end. What's up everybody, I am Jasprit Singh from the MinorityMindset.com, where money minds rethink rich. The housing market has seen its biggest boom ever between 2020 and 2021, and naturally, this has some people worried about what's coming next in the housing market. We've been seeing this housing market boom for three main reasons. We had these very low interest rates, so people wanted to capitalize on these cheap mortgages and go out and buy a home. We've seen a limited inventory of homes available for sale, so people now were competing to buy these few homes that were for sale. And then you had a huge demand of buyers. Some people wanted to take advantage of these low mortgage rates, and then you had the people that were now able to work from home and they wanted to upgrade and they wanted to have a home with an office that way they could work from home. Put those three things together and now you've created the perfect storm in the housing market where you have everybody trying to buy a home and because there's not that many homes available for sale, the buyers are having to fight against each other and the way that they're doing that is by bidding wars. They were outbidding each other which pushed home prices up and now we have home prices skyrocketing making homes less affordable for regular people. Up until the middle part 2021, all you heard was positive news about the housing market. All you heard was how home prices kept skyrocketing and how sellers kept getting above asking price prices for their homes. And all you kept hearing was how low the days on market were for homes because people were buying homes like crazy. But now you're really starting to see a shift in tone in the housing market because you're seeing people talk about how homes are not being sold at their asking price. Now sellers are being forced to cut their asking prices. Part of the reason for that is because they've already been asking such high prices, but you're starting to see sellers now cut the prices of their homes and you're starting to see people get worried about home prices slowing down. Now, none of this should really be a surprise. I mean, we've seen home prices go up pretty much like this, while wages went up kind of like this. You have to see some sort of correlation between housing prices and wages, because if home prices grow way faster than wages, then you're gonna hit a point where people will not be able to afford homes. Because if your income is not growing with the housing prices, then you're just not gonna be able to afford a new home unless mortgage rates go down more, making homes more affordable. And now we're in an economy where mortgage prices are already at rock bottom, while home prices are way up here. And so now what's gonna give? If mortgage prices go up, now owning a home is gonna be much more expensive and people are already struggling to afford the price of homes as they are right now. This is why CNN just wrote a piece talking about our housing market right now, comparing it to the housing bubble back before 2008, saying that we have some similarities between now and 2008. But before I analyze that article, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash the thumbs up button below. And if you haven't already, be sure to join our free Discord server called the Guac Talk community. We call it Guac Talk because as we all know, extra guac is truly a symbol of extra wealth and in this community you can chat about all things minority mindset you can chat about the stock market the real estate market the cryptocurrency market and all things building wealth this community is completely free so if you want to chat with and network with other minority mindset thinkers i'll put the link to where you can do that in the description but no. CNN put out this article comparing the housing market that we have right now to the housing market before the 2008 crash. And the similarity that they say that we have is nobody thought that we were in a real estate bubble before the 2008 crash. And they say that nobody thinks we're in a bubble in the housing market right now either, which has them worried. The article says most economists and investors aren't focused on the housing market right now. Their attention is on other factors like the labor shortage and decades high inflation and supply chain disruptions. And of course, the ongoing pandemic and that's why this article says that people are ignoring this potential housing bubble that we have brewing these next two lines are very interesting it says that the good news is that very few economists believe that this current run-up in housing prices is a bubble that's about to burst so that's good news people don't think that we're in a bubble the bad news is that practically nobody was worried about the housing bubble in 2007 either. Now, what I wanna do is really go over what this article is talking about before I go into my opinions, because obviously I have some of my own opinions, but 
I want to focus on what this article is saying. That way we can understand that side. And then I'm going to go into my thoughts on it. So the article starts by talking about what happened last time. And what it says is that back in 2005, the then chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, came out and said, quote, that there is no housing bubble. Instead, he said that America has some bubbles in some housing markets, but there's no widespread housing bubble in the United States. They actually gave a direct quote from Alan Greenspan, and here's what he said. Quote, although a bubble in home prices for the nation as a whole does not appear likely, there does appear to be, at a minimum, signs of froth in some local markets where home prices seem to have risen to unsustainable levels. In other words, Alan Greenspan said that, yeah, we might have some issues in the housing market, but it's really not that big of a deal, and it's not going to affect the entire housing market, and you don't even have to think about this housing bubble potentially affecting the entire financial system. We all know how that turned out. A big reason why people do not believe that we were in a housing bubble back before the 2008 crash, according to this article, is because you had people still buying homes, even though home prices were going up. The article says that economists believed that the rising pace of home ownership meant that there was nearly an endless supply of buyers who would be able and willing to pay even though home prices have been surging. And that kind of sounds familiar, right? I mean, the reason why they thought that we were not in a housing bubble was because home prices kept going up and people kept finding the cash to pay. Now, obviously, there was different things going on then. It was very easy for you to get a loan, which made it more accessible for people to go out and buy homes even though they couldn't afford them. But that's what this article is saying. The reason why economists and investors and why the government and the Federal Reserve Bank did not think that we were in a housing bubble before the 2008 crash was because they thought that there was an endless supply of buyers. In other words, they thought that home prices could only go up and people will continue buying homes. So here's what they're saying. Back before the 2008 crash, we saw this massive run up in home prices and people kept buying homes even though they couldn't afford them. And that was a big reason why this housing market bubble burst back before the 2008 crash. And you can take a look at how fast home prices were rising to get an idea of what was going on. Back in 2005, this was the previous record for the fastest home price growth in a year ever. And in 2005, we saw home prices grow by 14.4% in one year. Well, now in 2001, between 2020 and 2021, we broke that record. We blew it out of the water because we saw home prices grow by 19. 9% between April of 2020 and April of 2021. And according to this article, kind of like last time, most economists think that home prices are going to continue growing at very high speeds. It says that Zillow has come out and said that we're going to see another 13.6% growth in home prices between September 2021 and September 22. And Goldman Sachs has come out and said that home prices will rise another 16% by the end of 2022. Those are pretty bold statements, even though Zillow has come out and said that they are ending their home flipping program because they're worried about the state of the housing market and they weren't able to liquidate their inventory of homes that they do have. And now at the other hand, they're also saying that they think home prices are going to continue going up quite a bit in 2022. So that's kind of an interesting statement. But we're also seeing home affordability at some of its lowest levels ever. The article says that by just about every measure, Home affordability has plunged even as record low mortgage interest rates have kept home payments in check. So to put that in perspective, we are seeing some of the fastest home price growth in history. That's nothing new. And part of the reason for that was in 2020, we didn't really see much home price growth because people were worried about this pandemic and you weren't seeing that big boom in 2020 that you saw in 2021. And on top of that, you have home affordability at some of the lowest levels ever, even though we have mortgage rates at the lowest levels ever. So you can go out and qualify for a cheap mortgage, but home prices are way up here. So what happens if mortgage rates start to go up? Because the Federal Reserve Bank keeps saying that they want to raise interest rates as a way to mitigate inflation. And so if we see interest rates go up and home prices are way up here, now homes are going to be way more expensive because now you're going to have to pay more money on your debt. And this brings me to the final part of this article, which is the belief that prices will not crash this time. And to answer this question, they brought on the senior economist and co-founder of the Center for Economic Policy and Research, Dean Baker, who said that, quote, I don't think that we're going to see prices fall by 20 to 30 percent again, like we saw happen before 2008. He says, quote, I don't think that there's that kind of story out there. But he says that a modest rise in interest rates could lead home prices to slide between five and six percent. And the reason for why they think that we're not going to see the type of housing market crash now, like we saw before 2008, is because we have stronger underwriting standards now than we had before 2008. Before the 2008 crash, if you wanted to go out and get a loan, it was very easy. 
I mean, you could qualify for a loan even if you didn't have a job, even if you didn't have any assets because everybody thought home prices only went up. So you could go to the bank without a job, without assets, without cash in the bank, and they would still give you a mortgage. You're not saying that nowadays. And because of these stronger underwriting practices, they don't believe that we're gonna see the same type of housing market crash. So now let's talk about this because CNN says that the reason why we could potentially be in the biggest real estate bubble since 2008 is because we have home prices growing way faster now than we had before the 2008 crash. And because of that, and because of the fact that most economists don't think that we are in a housing market bubble, that is the reason why we are in a housing market bubble. This is what CNN saying. And this is kind of the TLDR. So now if we try to analyze this, we have to look at first the housing market by itself and then we have to look at the economy because housing prices are determined by supply and demand. When you have more buyers than sellers, this will push home prices up. When you have more sellers than buyers, this will push home prices down. So if we start by trying to understand the supply and demand, this will help us give us a good framework of what's going on in the housing market. The reason why we've been seeing so much demand for homes right now is because one, people wanted to take advantage of these low mortgage rates. And then second, people wanted to upgrade their homes because people wanted to move out of the cities. They wanted to move into the suburbs because now they're able to work from home. And if they lived in the suburbs, now they want a bigger home because they're spending more time at home with the ability to work from home. So people want an office in their homes. So people wanted to upgrade because of that and because people wanted to take advantage of these cheaper mortgage rates. You were able to now go out and get a home that's more affordable, even though it's more expensive because the mortgage rates were lower. But now we're starting to see that kind of flip again because mortgage rates are still down here, but home prices have grown so much where now it is more expensive for you to go out and buy a home, even though mortgage rates are less, just because you're having to borrow more dollars. The concern and the question is, when are we gonna run out of buyers? Because if we run out of buyers, then that's gonna force sellers to cut their prices. We're already starting to see that happen, but if we run out of buyers, then sellers are not gonna have an option but to cut their prices because now no one's gonna be buying their homes. What we've been seeing happen up until now is you might have a home worth, let's say $300,000. You list your home for $300,000 and over the weekend, you're gonna get 40 different offers on your home. And so now your home that's worth $300,000 has offers for $330,000. And now you sold your $300,000 home for $330,000. This is where your neighbor comes out and say, holy moly, you sold your home for $330,000? Let me list my home for sale too. Now your neighbor lists their home for $330,000 and then they get offers, they get a bidding war, and now they get to sell their home for $345,000. And then their neighbor says, wow, you sold your home for $345,000 and then they list their home for $370,000. And now this person who listed their home for $370,000 is saying, wait, I'm not getting the same number of offers that you did. So let me cut the price of my home to now $345,000, hoping that they're gonna be able to sell their home for around $345,000. This is exactly what that Market Watch article was talking about. The title is, quote, more sellers are cutting their list price. Here's exactly what economists and analysts think will happen next. The reason why we're seeing people cut the list price of their homes now is not because we're seeing a home price crash right now. It's because home prices have already run up so much that you have this whole kind of world of sellers now listing their home prices for way above what their home would have been worth just 12 months ago or 18 months ago. And so now because the same amount of buyers aren't there, they're forced to cut their prices down to something a little bit more reasonable, still way higher than it was a year ago, but a little bit more reasonable than it was a month ago. And along with that, we're also starting to see the inventory of homes starting to rise. You're seeing more sellers trying to take advantage of these higher home prices and they're trying to sell their homes. And you're also starting to see foreclosures happen again. We're seeing way more foreclosures happen now than last year, but still relative to prior to the pandemic, we still have a low amount of foreclosures, but we're starting to see foreclosures pick back up, which is bringing the inventory back to the housing market. And so now you have less buyers out there because they just can't afford these crazy high home prices. And then you have inventory that's starting to creep up. And so now when these buyers are looking at homes, they're saying, well, I don't just have one or two options. I have five or six options for homes now. And so you're starting to see less bidding wars and people don't have the same FOMO like they did before. And so you're starting to see buyers say, I'm just gonna wait it out. And so now sellers are saying, well, if I wanna sell my home, I have to cut my price a little bit. So you're starting to see a little bit of equalization in the housing market because before you had demand way up here and supply way down here. Now demand is starting to come down here and supply is starting to come up here. One of the most interesting things that I got out of this article was what Zillow said. 
Zillow said that they think that home prices will continue to grow very fast in 2022. They think that home prices are gonna slow down after 2021, but they still think that home prices are gonna grow by more than 13% in 2022. That's still almost near the 2005 previous record levels, but at the same time, Zillow has also shut down their home buying and their home flipping program. The way their home buying program worked was Zillow identified homes around the country that they think that they could flip for a higher price. They would just buy the home, do a little bit of cosmetic repairs, like putting lipstick on the home essentially. And then their goal was to hold on to the home and sell it for a big profit. And they dove into this pretty deep. They had bought hundreds of millions of dollars worth of homes. And now they have fully exited that program at a major, major loss. And on top of that, they had cut something like 25% of the employees that were in that program. And when they announced that they were canceling the program, you saw the stock price of Zillow tank because it showed how much money they lost because of this program. And this is where things get really funny because the reason, the reason why they stopped this home flipping program and the reason why they lost hundreds of millions of dollars on it is quote, this is from the CNBC article, quote, they said that they cannot accurately predict home prices. Zillow lost more than $300 million and a big chunk of this loss was due to this home buying program because they didn't know how to sell their homes and they were being forced to sell their homes at a lower price because they weren't able to get the higher prices that they thought, meaning the home prices weren't growing fast enough for them to make profits on their home buying. And because of that, they had to deal with this major loss and that's why they shut down this program. So they're clearly worried about the housing market because if they continue to think that home prices were going to grow at very high speeds, then they would just hold on to these homes and then sell them for a bigger profit in the future. But now they're starting to realize that the housing market is kind of volatile. And because of that, they're being forced to liquidate their homes at losses. Now, here's where I agree with the CNN article. I think we have a lot of issues in the housing market, and I think we have a lot of issues in the economy in general. Now, we don't have the same issues in our housing market today that we had before the 2008 crash, like they mentioned. Before the 2008 crash, we had very lax underwriting. Before the 2008 crash, pretty much anybody could get a mortgage, even if you didn't have the income, you didn't have a job, even if you didn't have a good credit score, and then you were able to go out and get this adjustable rate mortgage with a very low teaser rate. So it was very easy and very attractive for people to go out and buy a home. Nowadays, you don't have those same very easy underwriting standards. It's much harder for you to go out and get a mortgage today. You have to have some skin in the game. Most of the time you have to put down at least three or three and a half percent, if not more than that. But you have to put down at least a little bit of money for most homes to buy a home, which is not like what you saw before the 2008 crash. And you also don't have the same growth in adjustable rate mortgages. You're starting to see adjustable rate mortgages come back now, but you don't have that same kind of exuberance behind adjustable rate mortgages today like you did before the 2008 crash. The scary part is you're starting to see ARMS adjustable rate mortgages come back because people cannot afford their mortgage at a 30-year fixed rate at 3%. And so they're willing to go to an ARM, the adjustable rate mortgage. That way they can get a low teaser rate for the first five years. That's what's scary. But it's nowhere near what we had before the 2008 crash. The bigger issue that we have now isn't directly in the housing market itself. It's in the broader economy because our economy is not able to function at full speed like it did before the pandemic. Pandemic. Right now, our economy is not growing as fast as we would like, and we don't have enough people working as we would like. And so if our economy started to slow down in 2022 or 2023 or even 2024, and now you have home prices that are way up here, and then you start to see interest rates go up because the Federal Reserve Bank keeps saying that they need to raise interest rates. When are they going to raise interest rates? I don't know. They say either 2022, maybe 2023, but eventually they're going to have to raise interest rates as a way to kind of cool down inflation. Inflation. So when we start to see interest rates go up, and if we continue to see home prices stay where they are, or even grow slowly, you are now going to have homes that are much more expensive. Even if home prices don't grow that fast, they're going to become much more expensive if we start to see mortgage rates rise. And now if mortgage rates rise and home prices are still growing slowly, now it's going to be much more difficult for people to go out and buy a home because now homes are so much more expensive. And if we hit that point and wages do not keep up with all this home price growth and wages do not keep up with inflation because now life is so much more expensive than before, because now not only are your housing costs way higher, but your cost of groceries are higher, your vacation costs are higher, your car is more expensive. So now if your life is so much more expensive and your wages are not keeping up or the economy slows down and you start to see less jobs in the market, 
Now we have issues because at the end of the day, the way that people are able to pay for their homes is because of the jobs. And if they don't have a job or if the job isn't enough to pay for their home, then people are not going to be able to buy homes. And if you see that happen, now demand starts to go down. And if you continue to see supply go up because we're seeing a lot of homes being built right now. So now if we start to see supply go up like this while demand is going down like this, this would cause housing prices to flip. Now, are we gonna see another home price crash like we saw before the 2008 crash? I don't know how likely that is. Now, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I cannot predict the future. We don't have the same housing market issues like we did before the 2008 crash, but our issues are more on the economic level. So if we start to see deep-seated issues in the economy and they start to play out, that could trickle down into every sector and every industry. But the question is, what's gonna to happen to our economy? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that this type of home price growth isn't sustainable. I mean, it's just impossible to sustain any type of home price growth like this. So you're probably gonna see home prices start to slow down. You might even see home prices start to correct. That would be natural because we've seen home prices grow so fast to the point where people just cannot afford homes. So if we start to see home prices cool down or even correct a little bit, that wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. I think everybody's kind of expecting that. But a crash is when you see asset prices fall more than 20%. If you see asset prices fall by 10 or 15%, that's a correction. More than 20%, that's a crash. And so a correction wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. I think we need a correction. I think we can expect a correction at some point in the future because we've seen home prices grow so fast. Now, part of the reason is because we have all this free money out there. People were able to borrow money for cheap and you had all this money printed in 2020 and 2021. So this money has to flow somewhere. But again, if wages do not keep up and people cannot afford homes, then that would cause home prices to go up. And if they rise so fast and so much faster than your income, then you would have to see that kind of correct. But again, the reason why this is so hard to predict is not just because the economy is hard to predict, but we also have so many X factors, government factors, things that are under our control. Nobody thought that we would see this type of mortgage moratorium or foreclosure moratorium in 2020 and 2021. So it's impossible to predict what the Federal Reserve Bank and the government will do. So that's another factor that you have to factor in into the economy because we don't know what they're gonna do. They can extend this housing market for as long as they want if they continue to pump cheap money into the system, if they continue to create new programs to make it impossible to foreclose, if they continue to make new programs to make it much harder for home prices to correct with the free market. So if you're in the market for a home or you've been thinking about refinancing your home, the most important thing that you need to be doing right now is making sure that you can buy a home that you can afford. You have a lot of people saying, oh, I don't know if I should buy a home because what if home prices slow down? What if they correct? But you can never predict that. And so what you don't want to do is is try to enter the business of trying to time the market because it's gambling. Maybe you'll be right, maybe you'll be wrong. It's impossible to predict what will happen, but what you can do is make smart decisions today. So if you're looking at buying a home, that's fine. Just make sure you can buy what you can afford. And same thing, if you're gonna refinance, that's fine. Make sure you can refinance what you can afford and get a fixed rate mortgage. Do not go into the adjustable rate mortgages because our mortgages are at rock bottom right now. And the Federal Reserve Bank keeps saying that they want to raise interest rates and they'll probably be forced to raise interest rates as a way to mitigate inflation. And so if you're taking an ARM, an adjustable rate mortgage, sure, for the first four or five years, you have a very low teaser rate. Great. But if you don't plan on paying off your home in the first five years, what's going to happen? Well, after the five years, your payments are going to go up. So just lock in that low 30 year mortgage or 15 year mortgage or whatever you want. Just lock it in. That way you can take advantage of these low mortgage rates. And if you are looking for a mortgage or a refinance right now, just make sure you shop around because some lenders are going to charge you a whole lot more in fees and interest than other lenders for the exact same loan. And it's so easy to do that nowadays because of the internet, because you can just use a mortgage comparison tool. And the following is an advertisement from our sponsor Credible who operates a mortgage comparison website. At Credible, you can check pre-qualified mortgage or refinance rates at no charge to you. They have multiple lenders competing on their marketplace so you can compare great rates and pick the option that's best for you. The process is simple. All you have to do is go onto Credible's website and enter in a few pieces of information, which just takes a few minutes, and then Credible will present you with actual pre-qualified rates from different lenders, that way you can compare. Their pre-qualification process is easy to use. It only takes a few minutes, and checking pre 
pre-qualified rates does not affect your credit score. So if you want to learn more and see what mortgage or refinance rates you might qualify for, I'll put the link to where you can do that with Credible in the description below. Credible does pay minority mindset and advertising fee when you submit a pre-qualification request and Credible Operations Inc. NMLS number 1681276 is not available in all states. So if you want to learn more and see what mortgage or refinance rates you might qualify for, I'll put the link to where you can do that with Credible in the description below. This is where everybody says, but what about the foreclosures? Because now we're seeing almost 70% more foreclosures towards the end of 2021 than we saw in the end of 2020. But that data doesn't give you the full answer. According to CNBC, towards the end of 2021, we are seeing about 25,000 foreclosures starting the process in the United States, which is almost 70% higher than the amount of foreclosures that we saw in the end of 2020. Now, if we just look at that data by itself, it's pretty scary. Holy cow, foreclosures are up by almost 70%. That's something wrong. The reason why you're seeing so many more foreclosures in 2021 relative to 2020 is because in 2020, you weren't seeing any foreclosures happen. So if you see any foreclosures happen in 2021, it's going to seem like a big drastic increase compared to 2020 because you saw nothing happen in 2020. Now, we're starting to see foreclosures go up in 2021, but as of now, as of the time of me recording this video, we're still nowhere near the amount of foreclosures that we were seeing before the pandemic started. So yeah, we're starting to see foreclosures grow, but we're not seeing the amount of foreclosures that we had before the pandemic, but this is something you definitely wanna keep your eye on because if we continue to see foreclosures ramp up, if we continue to see foreclosures grow at this rate, then we have a problem. But as of now, foreclosures are still nowhere near where we were before the pandemic, but this is something that you want to keep your eye on. But it also makes sense. The reason why you're not gonna see a lot of foreclosures yet is because home prices are still going up. So let's just assume that you bought a home and you can no longer afford the payments. Well, what do you do? You can refinance because you probably have some equity in your property, even if you haven't really paid any principal into your property because home prices have gone up. And even if you can't refinance, then what? Well, then you can just go out and sell your home and you can probably sell your home for a profit because home prices have gone up so much. And so wherever you are in the country, if you have a home that you cannot afford, there's really no reason for you to go into foreclosure unless you're in one of the pockets that have seen a downturn in the housing market. But for a lot of areas, it doesn't make sense for a lot of people to go into foreclosure because you can just sell your home for a profit, walk away with some cash, and now downsize. Now, of course, there's exceptions to that, but this is kind of what we're seeing across the board. You have home prices that are way higher now than they were before, and so if you're struggling to make your payments, just sell your home for a profit and go move somewhere else. So while we might not see a huge uptake in foreclosures yet, you might see a lot more people selling their homes because if they start to struggle with their housing payments, Maybe they can't find a job, or maybe their income isn't enough to support their housing payments. If you start to see people struggling with their home payments, instead of people going into foreclosure, you'll probably see more people start to sell their homes. And this is what you also have to pay attention to because we've been seeing inventory rise month over month over month. And one of the reasons for that is because people are now saying, hey, I wanna capitalize on these higher housing prices. And also people that are struggling with their home prices would much rather sell, walk away with some cash than go into foreclosure. So as long as you're in a housing market with growing prices, you're not gonna see a huge uptick in foreclosures because people have no reason to go into foreclosure if their home price is higher than what they bought it for. If somebody has equity in their home, there's no reason for them to go into foreclosure closure because they can just sell their home for a profit. That's why the real test of how strong a housing market is will come in once we start to see interest rates go up because that's going to affect the amount of buyers that we have. It's going to really impact the demand side of things. We're already starting to see the supply side start to increase. Now you're starting to see a little bit more foreclosures. People are starting to sell their homes more and people are starting to build their homes now because we had to deal with all those labor issues. We had to deal with all the supply chain issues. It's still pretty difficult, but we're starting to see more homes enter the market. So we're going to see supply start to increase. And the way that we would decrease the demand is if homes became much less affordable. And we're going to continue to probably see home prices grow, not as fast as they were before, but we'll continue to see home prices go up. But then if and when interest rates go up, now this is going to make it much more expensive for these buyers to go out and buy a home, which would push the demand down. That's when we're going to really put the housing market to the test and understand how strong and stable our housing market really is. If interest rates go up and we don't see a massive decline in the buyers, well, then that would be a great sign. Now our housing market is stable. But if interest rates start to go up and our demand just completely goes away, which is kind of what we've been seeing happen in 2021, because anytime you saw mortgage rates go up a little bit, you started to see mortgage applications just drop like a rock. And so the question is, okay, 
if we start to raise mortgage rates in 2022, let's just say, if mortgage rates start to go up in 2022 and we still see buyers just go away, well then we might have some more problems in the housing market, but we will not be able to predict that until we see what really happens when mortgage rates go up. Yes, mortgage rates going up will make it more expensive for people to buy homes and if people do not see their wages grow, then we could see a flip in the housing market. But this is where you have to pay attention to what's going on, not just in the housing market anymore, but also in the economy because the issues that we have in the housing market go way beyond just the housing market. You cannot look at the housing market just in a bubble. You have to look at the housing market and understand how that plays a factor in the broader economy. If you like what you saw so far, then you're gonna love this. For most people, your housing expenses are your biggest expense. And so if you don't know how to manage your housing expenses the right way, you can way overpay for your housing. I've already made videos explaining the best way to buy a home and when it makes sense for you to rent your home instead of buy your home. So if you wanna watch those videos, I will link those videos for you in the description below. But today, I wanna talk about when it makes more sense for you to buy your home instead of renting your home. When you own the home that you live in, now you're building equity and hopefully one day you're gonna be mortgage free so you can live without having a housing payment and now you own your property. You are a homeowner. But here's the thing, unlike what the government says and what your bank says, home ownership is not for everyone. When you try to have everybody become a homeowner, that's how you get a repeat of 2008 because now you have a whole bunch of people owning homes who cannot afford a home. But there are certain times, like if you follow the five things that I'm gonna be talking about in this video, where you should not be renting your home. The first reason why you should not rent a home is if you have a lot of extra cash that you have sitting there in your bank account that you're not investing and that you don't plan to invest. I see this happen all the time when people are frugal with their money, but they also are scared to invest their money, especially if you are a high income earner. So if you are a doctor and you live below your means, but now you'd have all this extra cash that you're just saving in your bank account because because you're scared to invest your money, then what you see happen over time is these people don't have six months worth of expenses saved or a year's worth of expenses saved. They have three, four, five years worth of expenses saved sitting in their bank account. And for some people, especially if you're a high-income earner, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not a million dollars, just sitting in your bank account, sitting idle, doing nothing. If you have a lot of cash in your bank account, so we're talking more than six months worth of expenses, or if you wanna be a big saver, more than 12 months worth of expenses, and this cash is just sitting in your bank account and you don't have any plans to invest it because either you don't want to invest your money or you feel like you already have an investment plan or you're scared of investing your money. So you have this cash sitting in your bank account and you don't know what to do with it. Well, now you can use this cash as a down payment for your home. Now, this is a safer investment. I don't like to call your own home that you live in an investment, but for the purposes of this video, it's a safer investment because now you are gonna be the one paying the mortgage. And so hopefully you trust yourself to pay the mortgage. And so now you're gonna be building equity in your own home. When it comes to actually affording the home that you live in, you gotta afford the down payment, the monthly payment, and the moving costs. If you wanna actually be able to afford your down payment, you need to be putting down a minimum of 20%. So if you're buying a $100,000 home, that's $20,000. You're buying a $300,000 home, that's $60,000. You're buying a million dollar home, that's $200,000. So this is where a lot of people try to squeeze themselves because they look for ways to lower their down payment because that makes it easier for you to be able to afford your home. But now, if you have a lot of cash sitting there and you are not planning on investing this money, you can use that money as a down payment to now buy your home. And now when you buy your home, you already have a decent amount of equity in your home. By the way, as a little side point, if you don't have 20% to put down for your down payment, your bank is gonna charge you extra fees like PMI and they might charge you a higher interest rate because if you have a lower down payment, then your bank is gonna look at you like a riskier investment and so they're gonna charge you a higher fee or higher interest rate to make up for this higher risk. If you're putting down 20%, you can avoid those higher fees and those extra fees because now you have more skin in the game. So the bank is gonna look at you like a safer investment and they're gonna charge you less money in interest, which means you get to keep more money in your pocket and you don't gotta worry about making your bank as rich because you're not paying the bank as much in fees. So if you have a lot of extra cash in your bank account beyond your emergency savings and beyond your investments, use this cash to buy a home instead of renting because now at least you can put that money to good use in a safer way than just keeping your money in the bank where it's getting eaten away by inflation. The second reason when it doesn't make sense for you to rent anymore after you got enough money to afford the down payment is when you can afford comfortably your monthly payment. Remember what I talked about just a minute ago? If you wanna be able to afford your home, you gotta afford the down payment, the monthly payment, and your moving costs. So when you look at your monthly payments, if you wanna be able to afford 
afford your monthly payments, you have to be paying less than 25% of your net take home pay. So this is after taxes. So a quarter of your income or less should be going towards your monthly payment. Now, when it comes to your monthly payment and being able to afford your monthly payment, that includes your mortgage, that includes your property taxes, that includes your maintenance, and it includes your homeowner insurance. So your monthly payment, just 25%, should be covering your mortgage payment, your property taxes, your maintenance, because sometimes your window's gonna break, your AC's gonna break, things happen. When you own a home, things will break, so you gotta kinda budget this in there, and your property insurance, because the last thing you want is for your home to burn down and you don't have insurance to cover you. If 25% of your net pay can cover these expenses and you got the cash for a down payment, then it doesn't make sense for you to rent a home. Go out and buy a home and be a homeowner. One thing that you wanna keep in mind here when it comes to your monthly payment is that interest rates, mortgage rates, are gonna really change how much you're paying every single month. If you have a lower mortgage rate, you can save a lot of money on your mortgage. So when you're shopping around to get a mortgage, make Make sure you actually shop around. It kills me to see how many people do not do this, okay? There's a ton of mortgage comparison tools on the website that can help you do this. That way you don't gotta damage your credit score. That way you can see which lender is gonna provide you with the best interest rate because a little bit of an interest rate difference can save you a ton of money over the long run. If you wanna learn more about how to do that, our team broke down how to actually compare mortgage rates and how to save a lot of money on your mortgage on our website, theminoritymindset.com. And if you wanna read that article, I will link it for you in the description below. The third thing you gotta look at is, are you ready to settle down? Because when you buy a home, that's a long-term commitment. You're getting a mortgage from the bank for 15 or 30 years. And so now, if a year later, you gotta sell your home because now you're moving away and home prices came down, now you might be paying money out of your pocket to cover the cost of your home. If you're just renting your home and you gotta move out after a year, well, there's a good chance your lease is only one year long and if you do have to break your lease early, then you can typically work with your property management company and your landlord, that way it doesn't cost you too much money, but it's not gonna be as much as if you had to pay out of pocket because home prices went down. So when it comes to settling down, I want you to have a plan to live in the home that you're buying for a minimum of three years. I'm gonna put a little asterisk there, I'll explain why in just a second, but if you don't plan on living in this home for three years or more, then you probably should not be buying the home, then it might be better for you to rent. Now, the reason I have this asterisk here, because there is an exception to this rule. It's a type of house hacking that can allow you to start building wealth through real estate investments without having to pay some of the higher fees of being a real estate investor. So I'm gonna make this one number 3.5 because it kind of balances out the settling down thing. So real estate investing kind of has this almost a loophole where if you go out and you buy a home for yourself to live in, then you get a lower mortgage rate, your interest rate, than if you went out to buy an investment property. If you wanted to go out and buy an investment property, your bank is gonna charge you way more fees and higher interest because now you are a business person and an investor versus a homeowner who wants to live in a home. When you go out and buy yourself a home to live in, Typically, banks have this kind of clause which says that you have to live in the home for at least one year before you can rent it out. So if you go and buy a home to live in, you can't just go buy this home, live in there for two weeks, and then rent it out to somebody else, and then take advantage of these lower interest rates. But typically, make sure you talk to an attorney before you do this because you wanna make sure your documents say this, but typically, if you go out and get a mortgage, you'll be required to live in the home for at least one year before you can rent it out. So if you go out and you buy a home to live in yourself, and you live in there for one year, after one year and one day, you can move out of the home, rent it out to somebody else, and now you own this home with a little bit more equity because you've been paying your mortgage on it for one year, and you have a very low mortgage rate because you have a homeowner's mortgage rate, not an investor's mortgage rate, and so now when you have a tenant living there, you can have higher profit margins because you don't have as many fees as somebody would if they bought the home as an investment. So it doesn't make sense for you to rent a home if you plan on settling down, meaning living there for three or more years, but there is an exception to that rule if you plan on house hacking meaning you plan on living in the home for a year and one day or whatever your bank's clause is. And as soon as you hit that clause where you can now move out and rent it out to somebody else, now you can move out, get yourself a new home and start the process all over again with another home. And now you have just got yourself a rental property that's producing you income. Now, before I move on to number four, if you do wanna learn more about different types of house hacking, which can allow you to live basically mortgage free, I already made a video explaining how to do that. And if you wanna watch it, I will link that video for you in the description below. If you qualify for the first, second, 
second and third or third and a half thing that I talked about, then you should not rent a home if you're tired of paying someone else's mortgage and you're ready to start building your own equity in your own home. Because when you rent a home, your chances are renting a home from a person who owns one home or multiple homes. And chances are this person owns these homes with a mortgage or debt on these properties. And so when you're paying this rent payment, you're paying this landlord who's now going to use your rent payment to pay their mortgage, to pay their property taxes, to pay their insurance, and put some money back in their pocket. So if you're tired of paying off their mortgage and you want to start building your own equity, then you got to be a homeowner. Because now when you're the homeowner, yes, you have higher expenses. You got to pay property taxes, you got to pay insurance, you got to pay for the repairs. But now you're also going to be building your own equity in your home because every time you make a mortgage payment, some of your mortgage payment is going to go towards the principal value of your mortgage. The other part is going to go to the bank. But now every single month, you're going to be building more and more equity in your home. So now the goal is after 15 years, 30 years after your mortgage is done, now you're going to own your home free and clear. So you got a home where you don't got to pay any housing payments. And so you get to live rent free and mortgage free. The mistake that I see so many people make is they buy a home because of this point right here and they ignore everything else. They think, oh, I want to stop paying my landlord's mortgage and I want to stop making my landlord richer and I want to start building my own equity and my own wealth. So I'm going to go out and buy a home. But then you ignore the first three things. You don't have enough money for a down payment. So you stretch yourself way too thin to buy a home. He cannot afford the monthly payments and so now you're living paycheck to paycheck because you wanted to buy this home that you couldn't afford and maybe you're not ready to settle down. Maybe you're going to move in a little bit or maybe you're just not ready mentally to settle down and be a homeowner. When you do that, when you buy a home solely for this purpose and you ignore everything else, now you're walking a thin line because if the economy slows down, and if real estate prices come down, now you're going to be the first person who is underwater on their home. And now if things change and you cannot afford your monthly payments anymore, you're going to be the one that's getting foreclosed on before anybody else because you wanted to buy a home that you couldn't afford. And when you buy a home that you cannot afford, you are the first person to lose everything when things slow down. Look, home ownership is great. The thing that I want you to do is I want you to be able to afford the home that you live in, in a good economy and a bad economy. That way, even if things go bad, you can still sleep at night knowing that you're going to own the home that you live in without really having to run into problems. And the fifth reason when you should not rent a home, you should actually go out and buy a home, assuming you can afford it, is if you are a handyman or a handy woman, because now you might enjoy doing upgrades and repairs to your property, whether it's a rental property or the home that you live in. But if you are the one doing the repairs and you're building this nicer home and you're renovating this home, if you own the home, now you're getting the added equity in the home because if you renovate your kitchen and you renovate the basement and you do all these nice upgrades into the property, your property is going to be worth more money. Now, when it's worth more money, you think you're just doing a fun side project because you're renovating the kitchen. But what you're actually doing is you just added $30,000 worth of equity in your home. I'm not a handyman. I'm the type of person that struggles to build a table from Ikea. So when I want to renovate my bathroom or my kitchen, I got to pay somebody else $10,000, $20,000 in order to do that. And now I might be able to add $25,000 worth of equity into my home because I paid $20,000 to have somebody do this. But if you can do it yourself and you enjoy doing it, now you can add a ton of value into your home, build more equity in your home just by doing side projects that you thought you were doing for fun. I'm a real estate investor and I try to take good care of my properties and make sure they're nice, but I've had handymen who lived in one of my properties and they would say, you know what, I want to upgrade this bathroom just because I want to have a nicer bathroom for myself. And so then they put in the work and they upgrade the bathroom just because they want to have a nicer bathroom to live in while the time that they're living in this property as a tenant. But when they move out, now I have a nicer bathroom. It's nice for me and it's nice for them because they get a nicer bathroom while they're living there. But if you own the home, then you get the upside when it comes time for you to sell the property. So if you can afford your home, meaning you can afford the down payment and you can afford the monthly payment and you're ready to settle down and you don't want to keep paying someone else's mortgage, then it makes sense for you to not rent a home and for you to own a home. And on top of that, it's icing on the cake if you like to do handyman or handywoman jobs yourself, because now you can just build equity into your own home. This point is not going to make my realtor friends or my banker friends very happy because there's a difference between being able to afford your down payment and just being able to make your down payment. If you go to a real estate agent and you tell them that you want to buy a home, they're going to try to find you the best home possible. Typically, the best home possible is also the biggest home possible. And coincidentally, the biggest home possible also gives your real estate agent the biggest check possible.